Speaker Series of the Year. Um, previously, we had Steve Ballmer from Microsoft, Meg Whitman from eBay, and Kaz Harai from Sony Computer Entertainment. Um, so our speaker today is in, in very, very good company. To introduce our speaker, we've enlisted the help of Dan Caprio, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Technology Policy and Chief Privacy Officer for the Department of Commerce. Um, as you can imagine, that's a pretty full plate of issues. Um, Dan works in the Office of Technology Administration, and the goal of Dan's team, which is, and I have to read this, to maximize technology's contribution to the U.S. economic growth, productivity, innovative capacity, and global competitiveness. Uh, Dan also has responsibility as the Chief Privacy Officer, to which he's uniquely suited, having championed privacy rights and balancing business interests at the Federal Trade Commission, working for the indomitable Orson Swindle. Um, Dan has a vast resume working in the private sector as well as on the Hill. Let me introduce Dan Caprio. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon see uh, so many friends and colleagues. I see the, uh, the FTC is, is well represented, so thank you for, for, uh, for coming here and for a, a treat. I see uh, Shannon Kellogg is here somewhere, the Director of Government Affairs for RSA Security and uh, someone that you all, you all need to, uh, to get to know. Um, today's co topic, uh, Keys to Inspiring Confidence to Enable the Next Round of Internet Innovation, uh, is central to our mission of the Technology Administration, where, as Tim said, we strive to maximize technology's contribution to the U.S. economy and serve as a policy portal for the technology community to the executive branch. Uh, TA plays a vital role in helping the Department of Commerce fulfill its mission of creating conditions for economic growth and opportunity for, by promoting innovation, entrepreneurship, and competitiveness. One example of an issue we're focusing on is RFID as an emerging technology application with immense potential to enhance commerce. Uh, commercial applications of RFID make it important for commerce to understand the technology, its potential, and the privacy implications. Uh, at the Department of Commerce, we're concerned about the economic impact of cyber attacks as the cost estimates of phishing, worms, viruses, and denial of service attacks soar into the billions of dollars and threaten to undermine consumer trust and confidence. Global information networks offer a wide range of economic and public benefits from enabling e-commerce and a range of other benefits to the way we lead our lives. However, interconnected information system, systems and networks bring vulnerability. Uh, to protect our information systems and networks, we need to develop strong public-private partnerships since, this, since the private sector owns and operates 85 percent of the U.S. critical infrastructure. The Department of Commerce is working with the Department of Homeland Security uh, to be supportive of an industry-led initiative to reach an agreement on shared responsibility principles among company CEOs at, as the leading suppliers and operators of information systems and networks. These shared responsibility principles would recognize that information security is an essential element of corporate governance. For instance, technology suppliers would commit to producing the highest quality of secure hardware, software, and services, while operators would commit to providing training of employees and system users with security awareness and training appropriate to their jobs and system access. I'm encouraged by the progress that industry's made to date and reaching an agreement on shared responsibility principles, and I'm optimistic that such an agreement can be reached and announced in the very near future. Uh, our speaker today, Art Coviello, understands that CEOs need to lead by example within their companies. Art knows that information security is not just a technology issue, but also a corporate governance issue that requires the attention of CEOs and boards of directors to bring accountability to three key elements of information security, and those, of course, are people, process, and technology. Uh, Art served early this year as co-chairman of the Corporate Governance Task Force of the National Cybersecurity Partnership, and with Art's leadership and passion, that task force uh, released a management framework uh, to integrate information security governance into the corporate governance process. So, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce to you Art Coviello my friend and the CEO who gets it. Well, I am indeed uh, delighted 
to be in the company of uh, of the luminaries that, that Tim uh, Tim mentioned. Actually, I'm quite humbled by it, but I'm I am delighted to have the opportunity to address you today. Uh, before I, I get into uh, my uh, my remarks on the next round of innovation on the internet, there are a number of uh, people I'd like to thank. First of all, Dan for his uh, his very gracious uh, introduction. Uh, and for his leadership, not only at the uh, Federal Trade Commission, but also now at, at the Department of Commerce. And I look forward to continue working with him uh, a great deal as we go forward. I'd also like to thank the, uh, the leadership of the Internet uh, Caucus, uh, specifically the co-chairs, uh, Senator Burns and, and uh, Senators Burns and, and Leahy and Congressman uh, Goodlatt and, uh, and, uh, and Boucher. So uh, appreciate, uh, I appreciate their, their leadership. And of course, I'd also like to thank uh, thank Tim uh, for uh, for organizing this and for for his leadership and advocacy uh, for the Internet uh, Education Foundation. RSA uh, is uh, is pleased uh, to be a member of the Internet uh, Caucus Advisory Committee. We're also a proud supporter of the National uh, Cybersecurity Alliance, and this is a public-private partnership sponsored by the uh, the Department of Homeland Security and. and uh, and the accompanying stay, uh, stay Safe Online campaign. And I'm particularly delighted to be in the Capitol during the uh, National Cybersecurity Month and encourage you to go to the Alliance's uh, website, which is at uh, www. Uh, www. You know, uh, staysafeonline.info. Uh, to put some context around my remarks, I, I thought it would be uh, important to share with you a little information about RSA security specifically. Uh, we have a vision, and our vision is very, uh, very simple and very straightforward. Our vision is to inspire everybody, that's everyone and everything, to confidently experience the power and potential of the Internet. Now, that may sound like a grandiose uh, vision for a security company, um, but uh, I hope you'll agree uh, over the course of my remarks that security is an absolute fundamental piece of the equation for not only the existing uh, productivity we get from the Internet, but for all future innovation as well. We have a mission that guides us uh, in the fulfillment of our vision, and that's to secure people's identities, not just people, but the the devices uh, that people interact with in the applications, and enable people uh, to conduct secure transfer of information and secure transactions at the same time in a private and confidential uh, manner. Uh, we have a number of accomplishments. Uh, every single one of you probably uses our technology every single day. As a matter of fact, because we're, our encryption is at the foundation of all Internet applications, I actually believe it's probably the most ubiquitous uh, use of a technology in the world today. It's in every, uh, every browser that is used, it's in phones, it's in hardware, it's in all major software products. We estimate that it's in billions of units of products that have been sold worldwide. And our Secure ID uh, tokens are in the hands of, uh, of close to 15 million users now. Uh, matter of fact, the Senate uh, is, uh, is a customer, as is the, uh, as is the White House. So, uh, if, uh, if you uh, access networks uh, remotely, uh, chances are you're using one of our, one of our tokens, and we've, uh, we've shown tremendous leadership. Um, we also host the, the leading security conference every year, the RSA conference, uh, out, on, uh, out on the West Coast uh, in Silicon Valley, where the company's uh, roots actually were. Uh, we have it every year in San Francisco, uh, about 10,000 attendees. Over two, uh, we usually get about 1,200 submissions for papers for, for speakers, and from that we select 200 uh, speakers at, at the conference. It's, it's this coming February, starting uh, on the 14th through the, uh, through the 18th, so I'd also call your attention to that uh, as well. as 250 uh, trade show exhibitors. Uh, it's not just ourselves, it's all of our competitors and all companies uh, in the security space. And I'm pleased to say that uh, uh, our friends at the NSA actually have uh, have a booth, which is uh, unusual for uh, for that organization, but they deem it to be uh, that important that they come. Uh, we have over 1,200 uh, of I think the finest uh, 
uh, people in, in the space in technology and security. Uh, we operate development sites not only in Bedford, Massachusetts, where our headquarters is, uh, but also in, in San Mateo in, in California, and that's where we do the bulk of, uh, of our development. Uh, in terms of my background, uh, again, I, I am humbled in, in the company uh, of, uh, of speakers that you've heard uh, this year and maybe more so when you, when you hear the rest of it. I'm, uh, I'm not only C CEO of a security company, uh, I do know a lot about security, but I'm also a certified public accountant. Now, some of you may be impressed with that, but I think uh, according to the New York Attorney General, Elliot Spitzer, that might qualify me as a member of two criminal classes. So um, <laughs> hopefully that you'll see it uh, a little bit more positively uh, than that. So my topic um, is to talk to you today about the keys to uh, inspiring confidence that will enable the next round uh, of innovation on the, uh, on the Internet. Um, and before I do that, uh, to talk about the next round, I have to give, uh, I think, again, a little bit more context in terms of where we are today exactly. Um, many of you may have heard of a fellow by the name of Nicholas Negroponte. He's uh, very, uh, uh, very important, uh, runs the MIT Media Labs. And in the mid to late 90s, he said the following. The Internet is the most overhyped and yet underestimated phenomenon in history. Think about that for a second. Um, I happen to think it's equally true today. I think because of the dot-com crash, everybody thought that, well, okay, the Internet's kind of fine for uh, maybe buying a book on Amazon.com or, or maybe getting information, and these search engines are a little bit difficult. But think about how the Internet has already changed the fabric of our lives. And why is the Internet so important? The Internet is so important because it gets us something we can't buy, time, time. Think about how it affects your lives already. You might already be no longer standing in lines at the Department of Motor Vehicles because you do your transactions with them uh, online. You might be filing your tax returns more efficiently and more effectively online. You may be filing insurance claims online more fa uh, faster and more efficiently. You may be doing a lot of your shopping online. Um, and of course, you're going to obviously be able to acquire a lot of information online. All of these things buy you time. With respect to businesses, time translates into cost effectiveness and efficiency. And the Internet is used today by businesses to do things like, uh, like customer support. We ourselves take very, little, very few calls anymore over the phone for customer support, partially because our products are so good, but uh, also, also because we use the Internet for our customers to be able to place customer support uh, queries to us. They get to access a database. They do this all online. Very often they can solve the problem themselves. If they make these inquiries, uh, our customer support representatives pick them up uh, and can quickly call them back and solve their problems. But they don't have to wait endlessly for a phone to ring. So we are more efficient and effective uh, in doing customer support. There's rudimentary e-commerce being done online. Now, that may come as a surprise to you, especially since Jack Welch, before he retired, said that roughly a third of GE's, uh, well, however, uh, hundreds of, of billions of dollars of revenue they have was being done online. Well, uh, unfortunately, and, and I wouldn't want to get into a debate with Jack, but I, uh, I don't think that was actually happening. Now, there might have been a lot of inquiries about GE products online. There might have even been a few uh, contractual things that were sent back and forth through email. But I don't think people were uh, buying aircraft engines online from GE four or five years ago. Um, so there's reasons uh, that, uh, that we're not doing more. Uh, the technology has not been fully developed. Some of you may even say, well, you know, he's talking about time. I don't know, with all the email I do, um, I, I don't know how much time I save because of the Internet. It seems I, I actually spend more time because of the Internet. Well. Uh, but 
that uh, IT vendors need to do to harness the technology and make it easier and more simple uh, for people to use. And that's what this next round of the innovation is all about. I want to talk about two keys uh, to this next round of innovation before I talk about the third, which will be uh, security. The first is broadband. We need to do a better job deploying broadband. Uh, I was at a conference yesterday, and there were some statistics that were, uh, were, uh, were, were discussed about the deployment of broadband in the United States. Uh, if you go to Japan or South Korea, there's almost a 10x pricing differential, uh, and, and, or, or at least 5x pricing differential, between what they pay for broadband versus what we pay for broadband. Uh, whether, whether or not it's even deployed in remote issues, I won't even get into that, that subject. But there's also, in terms of speed, there's another 8 to 10 uh, 10x uh, multiplier in terms of the speed of the broadband in, in countries like uh, like Japan and, and South Korea, uh, and and uh, we need to do a better job there if we're going to deploy more and more applications using the internet. Also, one of the big problems with the dot com crash is that it was uh, the internet was oversold. The standards didn't exist. The reason that Jack Welch couldn't do 80 billion or 100 billion of revenue with GE is because whatever company he was trying to do business with, their ERP application couldn't talk to GE's ERP application without a whole heck of a lot of translation. So standards like XML have needed to be developed and need to be developed if we're going to have an effective supply chain using the internet. And there are related security standards like WS security, uh, SAML that will also make it easier to web enable applications and create web services. That's going to take some time. We shouldn't be surprised by it. Any major infrastructure in history has taken a number of years to roll out. I want to give um, a couple of historical examples. One uh, is my favorite, and, and I used this at the RSA conference this past year. Uh, in 1769, James Watt perfected the steam engine. It took another 30 years before Fulton had a steamboat and before anyone started to develop a railroad. Fast forward 50 or 60 years and there's an entire industrial revolution that has taken place largely as a result of the steam engine. But look at the elapsed time. The internet's only been around for uh, well, depending upon when Al Gore invented it, it could be 10 or 20 years. Um, uh, so so we're, we, we need to see these things play out. Uh, broadband will do better. Uh, creating standards that allow the, the real creation of web service and application, application interfaces, all of this will be developed. It's just going to take some time. And um, the development of the Internet shows striking similarities because whether we're talking about something like the transcontinental highway which was built on steam, it all resulted from multiple developers of a core technology with innovation occurring simultaneously around the world. That mimics the internet. Rapid improvements over many years, uh, eventual achievement of maturity standardization and ubiquitous uh, technology. That's the track we're on with something like uh, XML as a standard. Uh, in addition, I think it would be important for us to remember, and this gets back to how effective we are uh, with time on uh, using the technology, uh, a lot of ease of use and convenience was added to these infrastructures after the fact. So we need to develop these kinds of easier to use, easier to catalog, easier to dispatch emails that we don't need, easier to filter spam, all of those kinds of things to make things easier for the user. But the Internet is markedly different um, in at least one important way from these other historical examples. Um, and I think, uh, I think it's time to explore why. Uh, and this is where I head into the, uh, the security portion of the discussion. A survey published by Forrester Research earlier this year shows that 80% of the respondents are using the Internet to access and send email. Makes sense. 56% to research products for potential offline purchase. 
but only 21 percent of people actually conducted some kind of financial transaction online. And two-thirds of them are buying or selling in online auctions like eBay. So if roughly four out of five consumers are not using the Internet to transact some business, what's holding them back? Perhaps more important uh, from an industry perspective is what's holding back businesses. Well, I talked about the issue of, of standards and the ability to have an application, application interface and a web service. But why can't we go beyond that and, na and now that that technology is available uh, and create more B2B initiatives? Why aren't we building full-scale supply chains? Well, this is a place where RFID has the potential to play a great role. RFID is one of those add-on technologies, convenience technologies, ease of use technologies that would fit very comfortably uh, in a supply chain. If you can manage your inventory more effectively, if you know where every single piece of inventory is at all time, think of how much cost you can drag out of the supply chain. Think how much less obsolescence you would have if you're able to in implement that kind of a technology. Now, there are a lot of people that worry about privacy issues around uh, RFID, but I would say to you, let's let the technology get developed. Let's be thinking about the privacy issue, but let's not regulate it before it even has a chance uh, to be deployed and add to the convenience and use of the Internet as we integrate these vast supply chains. But ultimately, the answer is not about access, ubiquity, or cost, or broadband uh, bandwidth, storage capacity, or anything else. It's about something, I think, more fundamental, and that's confidence. How do I know the order is really coming from, um, uh, in, in my case, let's say GE is a customer. How do I know the order is really coming from GE if it, if it comes to me online? How can I vouch for the fact that uh, what takes place what takes the place of, of a purchase order, a signed purchase order, when you're doing business in an online supply chain? So confidence based on trusting who's at the other end of that supply chain is extremely important. Confidence in the individual companies, confidence in the underlying systems and technologies, and confidence with, the, with whom uh, we do business. And the need to address uh, confidence in the virtual infrastructure of the Internet is what makes it different in a fundamental way from any other infrastructure technology uh, that we've seen. And the underlying issue of confidence on the Internet is the chief problem that needs to be solved before we get to the next round of innovation on the Internet. Uh, security is the core technology for this. Let me give you uh, a metaphor that, uh, that was actually given to me by one of our customers, and, and, and I really cherish it because it explains security uh, in a nutshell. Because I think people have a tendency to look at security and say, it'll slow things down. It won't speed things up. But think about it for a second. If, if you look at security like the brakes on an automobile, what does a brake on an automobile do? It slows you down or it stops you. But in reality, it enables you to go as fast as you want. Why? Because you have the confidence that you will be able to stop when you need to. If I extend the metaphor a little bit further, there's no reason why security can't act a little bit like a steering wheel. It can steer the right people to the right application to do the right thing at the right time. That's access control. So security need not slow things down. It can actually allow us to have the confidence to speed things up. Make sense? But the Internet is also different from other, uh, other infrastructures in another fundamental way, because security is a shared responsibility. Uh, RSA security, in trying to fulfill its vision, can't do this alone. Other IT and, and ISV vendors can't do it with us. Government must participate, other businesses must participate, and individuals must recognize that they have a responsibility as well. We are interdependent on the Internet as never before. And all of us must act to implement security into the fabric of what we do 
and spread a culture of security, as, as Dan has, uh, has been quoted as, as saying, and our mutual friend Orson Swindle also frequently uh, says. So where do we stand in terms of, uh, of the application of security today? How well are we doing? Well, I happen to have with me, and it, it just came out uh, a month ago, uh, from the global accounting firm of, uh, of Ernst & Young. And it's, uh, it's the Global Information Security Survey from 2003. It was just published last month. Uh, I want to quote you uh, a few of the statistics from the executive summary. More than 34% of organizations rate themselves as less than adequate in their ability to determine whether their systems are currently under attack. More than 33% of organizations say they are inadequate in their ability to respond to incidents. 56% of organizations cite insufficient budget as number one obstacle to an effective information security posture. Um, I could extend that organizations, those aren't just commercial organizations, I can extend that to federal agencies as well. Nearly 60% of organizations say they rarely or never calculate an ROI for information security spending. This is one I particularly like. Why do you need to ca calculate an ROI for security? Why do you need to do that? If you were building a, build, a building, if you were a real estate developer, would you build a building without heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems? Would you calculate an ROI on that? You would just say it's fundamental to having a building. Security needs to be looked at the same way. Just a couple more of these statistics. Only 29% of the organizations list employee awareness and training as a top area of information security spending compared with 83% of organizations that list technology as their top information security spending area. Now, what did Dan say at the outset? It's about people, process, and technology. It's not just one thing. And the final one, only 35% of organizations say they have continuous education and awareness programs. That all needs to change. Um, let me give you some more alarming news. Now, I don't give you this uh, because I want to be a fear monger uh, and, and just um, be one of those uh, vendors that comes up to you and says, well, because of all of this, you need to buy all of these products. That's not my purpose here. But these are the facts. I will talk to you about how I think we shift the battleground. And it is not just about technology. It is about people uh, and process. And the issue of cybersecurity is indeed a complex one because new threats are constantly emerging. We're used to threats like worms and viruses that are general attacks that have a general amount of mayhem attached to them. Uh, they, they bring down entire websites. Um, they cause wide-scale um, problems with, uh, with computers. But what we're now starting to see as these attacks and threats evolve, they're still somewhat generalized, but now they're no longer for notoriety and general mayhem. The attacks are general, but they're designed to go after specific individual businesses and people for ill-gotten economic gain. Uh, any of you heard of phishing from 15 or 18 months ago? You would say no. Uh, almost all of you know that phishing is not just uh, about uh, a, a rock group that, uh, that my son um, shared with me when he was in high school. Um, I was never a fan. Uh, and I'm, I'm not a fan of this kind of phishing um, either. But nobody heard about it a year ago. Um, according to the Anti-Phishing Working Group, uh, and this one is another uh, antiphishing.org, you can go to this, and we're, RSA is actually a sponsoring corporate member. The number of unique phishing attacks that were monitored rose from 116. Now, I'm not talking about 116 people getting emails. I'm talking about the type of phishing attacks that goes out to millions of the pe people. 116 attack, uh, of types of attacks in December of 2003 to 1,422 in June of 2004. Now, uh, Australia, where I was just a couple of weeks ago, is the fourth most fished country in the world. Is Australia the fourth most populous country in the world? No. Uh, as Willie Sutton said about robbing banks, you go where the money is. It's not a coincidence that Australia has one of the most aggressive 
online internet banking programs in the world. What has been some of their response to these phishing attacks? They've actually started to scale back on the services that they offer or limit them based on dollar amount because of the sheer volume of fraud. That's going the wrong way. They need to implement solutions that will address the problem of phishing. But this is the impact that it can have if you no longer have confidence. Gartner Resource, Research estimates that phishing schemes alone have cost a, a whopping $1.3 billion in losses to U.S. banks, which aren't, aren't quite aggress as aggressive in terms of the services they offer, but obviously uh, we have a lot more banks and, uh, and people love to rob from the United States. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission reported earlier this year that identity theft topped the list of consumer complaints for the fourth year in a row. And I actually had a conversation with Orson about this because some of the, the, the numbers are just staggering. And I said, these aren't, these aren't people that have, have lost their identities online, are they? And he said, no, 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 no. He said, a lot of, this, uh, a lot of the identity theft occurs the old-fashioned way, social engineering, people that's called trawling through waste baskets and, and trash, uh, or stealing a purse or stealing uh, somebody's wallet and, and taking their identity and then using it. But the important thing to, to understand is that, that internet fraud, once an identity theft had occurred, represented 55 percent of all of the fraud complaints, up from 45 percent in 02. So people get somebody's identity and then use the internet because it's a quick way uh, to take advantage and perpetrate a fraud. And these numbers alone don't tell the full story. According to a June 04 Forrester report, 9 percent of U.S. online consumers, 6 million households that use the internet have experienced identity fraud. Um, I could go on and on, uh, but I'm not going to. Um, I did want to talk about a report that, uh, that Symantec uh, had that said that states that the, the swift rise in attacks may indicate a shift from attacks motivated by notoriety to attacks motivated by economic gain. And that reinforces a point uh, that I, I made earlier. Uh, so in this beautiful building, uh, with all its importance uh, to our nation's history and democracy, uh, I say to you, we can do a lot better. Uh, we don't have to be uh, subjects of fear. We don't need to let the technology rule us or have the technology take advantage of us. We can harness it and we can do better. So uh, let's talk about how we should go about doing that, shall we? First off, I don't think a rush to legislate is the answer, okay? So you don't have a lot of work to do right away on that. Um, uh, it, it's just, it's not likely to be the most efficient approach because the technology moves so fast. If you prescribe a particular technology or a particular technique, it could be obsolete by the time you pass the bill. So please go lightly uh, in terms of, uh, of the regulation. Uh, I do believe strongly uh, in the idea of a public-private uh, partnership that the National Cybersecurity Alliance uh, reflects. Because what happens as a result of that? A tremendous amount of awareness building. That's the first step. Education. Educating business leaders, educating organizations, leaders about their responsibilities. And it's not just the, re the understanding the threat, because as I said, you can, you can be anesthetized by these statistics. Uh, it's about what are the proactive, protective measures that we all need to take. Uh, well, one of the first things I think we ought to do is enforce existing regulation. How many of you think HIPAA is being adequately enforced? Um, I think, uh, and this is going to sound strange coming from a CEO of a public company, I think Sarbanes-Oxley is wonderful. Um, it's painful to implement, it's costing us a heck of a lot of money, but it's made us think through our entire business process. We will actually be more efficient and effective uh, as a result of implementing um, the uh, regulations around Sarbanes-Oxley, so that's a good thing. How does that relate, though, to security? Well, let me talk to you a little bit uh, as a CPA. Um, Sarbanes-Oxley addresses the issue of internal control. Internal control is about the safeguarding of assets 
and the proper and accurate recording of financial transactions. If you run your business partially on the Internet, don't you have an obligation as a fiduciary responsibility if you're a chief executive or a CFO to ensure that you have an adequate level of cybersecurity around your business? I think you absolutely do. When we did the corporate governance uh, task force that Dan referred to, I made this point, I couldn't have made this point more strongly. It's already a fiduciary responsibility. The fact that boards of directors, CEOs, and senior management have the responsibility for internal control means they have a responsibility to have proper systems of cybersecurity. It's fundamental. They go hand in hand. So building around awareness around that. And we've tried to give people the tools. The framework that I talked about, RSA has implemented. Uh, it's important that this word get out and that boards and CEOs recognize that. Training is obviously another important element of this because once you develop that framework, you talk about who's responsible for what and then how things get executed across uh, your company. And best practices. I'm, we're also a member of, uh, of an organization called TechNet. TechNet put, put out um, a checklist for around best practices. And it's not onerous. It's common sense. You start with the risk, risk profile of your organization. Based on your risk profile, you develop a set of policies. Based on the policies, you develop an architecture. And based on the architecture, you implement a set of solutions. And then you monitor that. You, you, uh, you measure uh, and track change. Uh, and then you start the cycle all over again. It's iterative. Security is not we do it once, we have a system. It's, it's constant. Um, I think it was Jefferson who said the, the cost of freedom of, is eternal uh, vigilance. Well, the same is true around security. Uh, businesses and organizations have to do that. They actually have a responsibility to take it a little step further, believe it or not, because if you have a partner that has access to your systems, you also have an obligation to understand the partner's environment because the possibility exists that someone can attack you from the partner or perhaps the customer. So it extends out. And I think some of the tenets of Sarbanes-Oxley need to be pushed out to nonprofit and non-public uh, companies as well, uh, at least in terms of some of the internal control uh, requirements. Um, let's talk about some specific technologies and one near and dear to my heart. Um, it, it, one, of the, one of the actual implementations of technology to reduce risk is in the area of authentication to verify the identity of users. Um, how many passwords do you have? Generally, you probably have five or six or eight for whatever organization you work for. And then at home, personally, you might have eight, 10, 15, 20, depending upon how active you are uh, in your use of the internet. Um, do you use the same ones over and over again? Do you have to change them? Is it a pain in the neck? Uh, well, I have some news for you. No matter almost how complex a password you make, passwords can easily be cracked. One of our customers showed me a list, uh, a, a computer printout, that was about 20 pages, um, 20 pages long. And it was a list of passwords that they internally hacked in anywhere from 12 seconds to 12 minutes. He then showed me a list that was, had to be 50 or 60 computer pages long of passwords that were hacked from 12 minutes to 12 hours. Passwords no longer make the grade. Um, they're, they're, they're too hard to remember, and quite frankly, they're too hard to administer. So companies like AOL and Microsoft, in conjunction with RSA Security, uh, are working to help eliminate passwords. Uh, you may have heard our announcement earlier this year. We've worked with Microsoft to substitute the secure ID token that you use for remote access for internal access to your system, substituting it for the Microsoft logon. AOL last month announced a service to protect the identities of, uh, of their customers 
uh, by issuing a secure ID token uh, as a premium service. It's called AOL Passcode. Uh, but it doesn't just stop there. What if when you logged on to AOL and strongly authenticated yourself with a better credential, you then were able to have um, within the AOL browser a list of your favorite websites. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just click onto the website and AOL could pass that information onto, say, eBay or Amazon.com or Citibank and have that identity recognized by those websites without you having to enter still another password? Whether that strong credential is created by RSA or somebody else, doesn't matter. The technology to federate identities exists today. What doesn't exist in a place where government may help is creating and understanding the liability for exchanging identity online uh, and working to to advocate for this. Uh, and, and the administration and, and the government is, is actually doing a, a fair amount around identity. The Bush administration's policy, for instance, for a common identi identity standard for federal employees and contractors uh, will also help. Um, and they're also, um, in their eGov initiative, um, we're looking at, uh, at a significant amount of, of federation and the ability to do information sharing. Wouldn't it be great if you could federate identities within the intelligence agencies or within the Defense Department to facilitate information sharing? That technology exists today. Okay. And the federal government needs to lead by examples. Uh, heal thyself before you talk about regulating uh, other businesses. We can't continue to get failing grades from Congress in the various agencies. The way you do that, the way you eliminate those failing grades is funding whatever people, processes, and technologies need to be put in place so that you'll get an A grade. So you do have the oversight responsibility here in Congress, but you also have the responsibility to give, give the various agencies their tool, the tools. Uh, and finally, uh, in this regard, I also support uh, the elevation of the cybersecurity position uh, at the Department of Homeland Security. I strongly advocate this. It's important to have a strong advocate in the department that has the proper level uh, uh, of authority and budget, and I will leave it at that. Uh, other areas that we need to attack. We must continue to innovate in general around areas of security and continue to improve the defense, not just the offense of, of enabling identities, but solve the problem of spam and spyware. One of the things I worry about uh, when you look at a phishing attack, uh, it's based on the, largely on the ignorance of the person being attacked, being duped into giving up information. I worry more about technology type attacks like spyware and malware that can do things like keystroke capture or, or get at confidential files uh, that have uh, important information without you even being uh, aware of it. So we need to solve that, improve content filtering, uh, and maintain the excellent work that I think we have done in antivirus protection and intrusion detection. We also have to write more secure code to begin with. Uh, and we must help everyone, especially the media, recognize and understand the complexity of this issue. You know, a lot of these technologies were not developed with the Internet in mind, specifically the operating system. So it's not like any of the IT vendors conspired uh, to create a system that had a lot of holes. By virtue of the fact that they were trying to make things easier for the consumer, they inadvertently created a lot of these holes, and it's going to take time to fix and correct them. So I do want to applaud the, uh, the increased focus that Microsoft, HP, Sun, and other platform vendors have had in this area, but they need to continue uh, to do a lot more. Uh, and we, ne we need to leverage uh, encryption technology as the foundation for privacy and confidentiality, ensuring that all applications and devices have it, especially with, when it comes to wireless. And I can extend wireless in this particular instance to RFID. Uh, as we create uh, systems that use RFID, we do have to address the issue of privacy and, and confidentiality so that consumers have confidence that this is a technology that works for them uh, and not against them. So to conclude, I believe that if we act on these suggestions, 
that everyone connecting to the internet and even the extended internet will experience it with a lot more confidence and only then will the internet reach its full potential. What is that potential exactly? It is about much more cost-effective B2B commerce, more sophisticated, more valuable, and significantly more integral to the fabric of our global economy. It's also about the social potential of the Internet, not the least of which, and this is what I think is the best part, is the higher standard of living worldwide made possible by lower cost transactions and fluid global communications. There I suggest that democracy will be spread more and more uh, as we do a better job uh, taking advantage of the free flow of information uh, across the Internet. And it will undoubtedly cause significant change, and we have to understand there will be unintended consequences in terms of, of jobs, balance of trade, uh, changes in government, and in many ways that we cannot fully understand. But Americans are innovative. Americans have always been able to respond, and I think will respond to this challenge as well. Confidence is the key. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, some time for some questions. Yes. Well, for, for, first of all, I think the Hill can, can help by, by helping the department uh, create this, this position um, within, within the Department of Homeland Security uh, and create some budget for it. Um, because I don't think we've gotten the mileage out of the public-private partnership that we intended when we had the, uh, uh, the, the, the group session last December out in Silicon Valley. So that's one thing. Uh, I'm also a big believer in, you know, before we, we, we regulate, um, that we need to do a much better job around enforcement. I mean, the Internet knows no boundaries. So what does it mean to necessarily regulate in the U.S. if we don't have international cooperation uh, around regulations and standards? But one thing that the international community can do uh, is go after the ISPs uh, that a lot of these attacks come from uh, people that are ISP subscribers in Eastern European uh, countries. Why can't, we, uh, why can't we move a little bit more forcefully around enforcement uh, and penalties for the people uh, that perpetrate these, these schemes? And, you know, I, I recognize that government has a right to protect it, its citizens and, and to regulate as, as they deem necessary, uh, but I would strongly urge that, that uh, you be careful because the I don't think the California regulation, for instance, around privacy uh, has done uh, anyone uh, particularly good. Uh, and it, it, in an essence, uh, creates law in California that almost the entire country has to uh, abide by. Uh, so I think we need to be careful around this. Um, and um, you know, to the extent that, that regulations around privacy or protecting identity uh, need to be made, then they need to be general enough so that they, they're not obsolete in a very short space of time, but then again, specific enough so they have some teeth. And that's a tough, tough challenge. Yep. Uh, to your point about the importance of uh, standards, mm -hmm. um, the, the RSA devices for a strong uh, personal identification, like the RSA, the Senate, the AML device, yep. are they based, is there a standard that they're based on, or is this a vendor proprietary um, the, the RSA time synchronous algorithm is proprietary to RSA. Uh, the important issue here is to have some type of a strong credential. Where we play in the standards is that the identity created using uh, an RSA token can be federated to other sites using uh, a standard technology called SAML. Um, so uh, there's lots of different proprietary solutions 
uh, around uh, uh, identity credentials, and, and we happen to have the most successful one. So you would advocate the standard for uh, communicating that identity once it's established being proprietary algorithm? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating any particular standard around the credential itself. We actually um, were leaders in the development of uh, the uh, X509 certificates and the public key cryptography standards. So digital certificates is, is another way uh, to identify people, and RSA led the way in developing it. We invented public key cryptography. Um, so that's uh, another technology that we use to authenticate people. Uh, it's just a little bit harder to deploy. The beauty of the Secure ID token is it requires no client software, so it's very easy and efficient. Uh, biometric um, technology would be great if it was cost effective uh, and you didn't have a significant number of false positives or, or negatives. And again, one of the things about biometrics is if you use that as an authentication device, uh, it's great if you're doing physical access or access to a particular device, but once it becomes a domain type uh, authentication, um, then you have, in essence, uh, reduced the biometric to a digital file that could conceivably be compromised. And uh, again, that's a place where RSA would play to protect that file. So this, uh, we believe in lots of different choices around authentication technology, and we happen to have one that works extremely well. Uh, SAML, the security assertions markup language. Actually, this, uh, as happens uh, in technology, there's three competing standards. Uh, some are, are various subsets or supersets of, of one another. There's a Liberty Alliance uh, standard, uh, and there's a web services security standard. In our particular product for federating identity, we, we actually support all three. Uh, now, you might say, well, why do we need three standards? Well, they do a little bit different thing. Um, but if you go back probably, I don't know, about 10 years, maybe a little bit longer, there used to be 26 different protocols uh, for routing packets around the Internet. Now there's one, TCP IP. Uh, so what I see happening is these standards will fold in on themselves and ultimately there'll be one superset um, and that will be the standard for transferring identity information across the Internet. Yep. I wonder if you touched upon social engineering and how going through trash and finding passwords. One of the other parts of social engineering is that with a study in Britain, 900 people surveyed and looked over passwords for candy bar. Um, you kind of touched on education. What do you think we need to do education wise in order to really educate users about security and about, you know, putting passwords in order to factor our education? Do you think we need to? Or how do you go about it? Well, it, it's, it's the consumer-facing organizations that need to do a lot of the work here. Obviously, the RSA conference is a place where we can show leadership, but it's not a consumer-oriented con uh, conference. But take AOL, for instance. Um, they're showing some significant leadership by offering strong authentication uh, as a premium service, and, and they're responding. Many, many banks are starting to look at the issue of, of security, not so much of, of authentication, not so much because uh, of the losses which so far they've been able to sustain and underwrite, but more as a result of the risk of loss of reputation. Um, facing organization, the banks, the e-tailers, uh, and the content providers uh, that need to help us uh, with the consumers, and, and government can play a, a very big role there as well. Yes. So if I understand correctly, it's essentially more regulation is not a good idea, you think, the public-private partnership is a good idea. Um, what I'm wondering is, particularly in the context of the common nature of the Internet, um, how, what, are, what are the models that you see would be good to look to with respect to this kind of uh, voluntary public-private partnership? Are there models in other areas of endeavor out there that are working there that you haven't had to have uh, Well, yeah, yeah, you know, I, this, is, this is where I have that argument about um, if a fundamental responsibility of an organization's chief executive is to protect its assets and ensure that transactions are properly recorded, uh, if they have that as a fiduciary responsibility now, why do you need more 
specific regulation than that. Uh, that's why I said we need to enforce regulations that exist. Certainly the accounting firms, when they come in to audit uh, around the issue, uh, around the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, regulations, they're certainly aware of it. Um, and there are, there's a great body of, of knowledge. I mentioned TechNet's checklist, but there's, there's, it, they're almost too numerous to mention of these sets of best practices that organizations uh, can follow. And if they follow them, they will largely um, solve a, a number of their problems. But it does relate to people, you know, the awareness and the training. It does relate to process, and it does relate to implement, implementing certain elements of technology. And that doesn't have any actual certification associated with it. So how do you actually, you know, when you have a plethora of these different sets of practices, uh, then actually you could have end up with more confusion because companies, how do companies determine that other companies are following a set of practices that they can assess as being appropriate? So I'm wondering whether, for example, you think that the, uh, you know, that the national or national standard setting. Model I, I think that would be a great place. I, I absolutely would agree with that. I think that would be a great place to go in terms of codifying these best practices. Uh, I think the accounting firms could, could do it as, as, as part of their uh, um, audit practices or, or statements on auditing standards that, that these are requirements. Um, so I, I think there's a couple of places where, where it could occur. And, and I wouldn't disagree with the, with the need to do that. Um, yep. Yes, in the back. How many? How many do you want? I could probably make you a deal. Let's say a standard office of 15 here, plus number of cases, 16. How much is it going to cost per unit to have? The 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 cost will have quite a a wide price curve based on a a quantity quantity model, but I will tell you that you have to measure some of the soft costs that you're already paying. Um, uh, help desk costs, password costs. Uh, if, if, you go to, um, if you go to RSA's website, you will find uh, a number of white papers that would actually help uh, explain the issue to you in, in a fair amount of detail. Yeah, we're, I, I would say we have 16,000 customers, and there's a pretty high level of satisfaction. And you know, if if you can't read six numbers off of a, a digital display and type them in over the course of a minute, you know, um, maybe I could get you some help. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I, I, it, it's hard to it's hard to respond. I, um, uh, you know, the, the, the technology is, is, uh, has been around now for, for a good 10 or 15 years. We think it's a cost-effective solution. Uh, I really would prefer not to make this about RSA and, and, and you know, have a more, more general discussion. Now. Yeah, well, I, I would certainly agree that um, security and privacy should be built in to the technology as opposed to bolted on. And I do think that the proponents of RFID uh, understand that. Uh, RSA, quite frankly, is, is leading um, in, in terms of research to develop something called a, a blocker tag. 
uh, which has the effect of, uh, of maintaining somebody's privacy without actually killing, uh, killing the tag. Uh, if you think about it, if, if you were using an RFID tag in a prescription, you might want to be able to bring the prescription back and have it refilled, but in the meantime, you'd want, your, you'd want to maintain your privacy. So we have the ability to create this, this blocker tag that would keep anyone from understanding what your prescription was or being able to scan it. Uh, and still allow you to to go back uh, and and use the uh, the un empty bottle to have your prescription refilled. So, uh, what I was advocating is that before we fully understand how the technology will get deployed, and before we go down a price curve that makes it practical to deploy, let's not rush and regulate it. If there are issues around privacy, you know we ought to we ought to raise them so that the technologists are, are building in either security or the privacy to, to protect consumers. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it.